We'll call the meeting to order at 633. Um, do we have any public audience comments that I'm unaware of? No, we don't this evening. All right, thank you. Uh, so we can start with board and administrative communications. So, Jen. I am good, thank you. All right, Lydia. Uh, yeah, things are still moving along with uh, CABE and, and, and CREC and NSBA. And um, I just uh, want to uh, comment that I am taking part in this anti-racist um, um, webinar. It's from the Connecticut Center for School Change, and and uh, Sue was also on the call and uh, or on the on the uh, participation of, as one of the attendees. So we had the first um, webinar and panel and and uh, breakout on Monday night, and we have two more to go. So uh, it's I'll, I'll be able to share much more with you when we complete. But this is something that I think uh, that I would share with my fellow board members about uh, participating with them at a future date. So um, so so that's it with me. That'd be great. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, Mr. Tindall. Uh, nothing tonight, thank you. Okay. Uh, Todd. Nothing for me. All good. Mr. Watson. I'm all set, thank you. Sharon. I can hear you. Okay, do you have anything to share tonight? Nope. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Murray. I'm all set for tonight, thank you. Okay, Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, just wanted to um, let the board know that we um, have in the last month been in negotiations with our SFEP unit, which is the Simsbury Federation of uh, Educational uh, Personnel, which uh, consists of our paraprofessionals and our secretaries. This was a delayed negotiation from the spring, um, and I am pleased to report that we reached a tentative agreement with the group um, last week, and uh, it is now in their court to, to ratify the agreement. Um, and if that happens in the next two weeks, we'll be bringing that agreement for your approval um, two weeks from tonight. So certainly thank you to my negotiating partner, Sue Lemke. Um, as well as uh, Kira Sheehan for um, her support on the financials um, and uh, Todd Burek as the chair of the committee for kind of the side council that I was able to do with him. So thanks. We think we have a good outcome and we'll be able to report out on it in two weeks. Terrific. Thank you all for your work on that. Mrs. Lemke. Just two quick things. First of all, we've transitioned our students with special needs back full time. And as the district has been kind of coming back to that full day schedule, full day, multiple day, we had prioritized our students with disabilities for that transition. So uh, certainly we're glad to have everyone back with us if they're not choosing distance learning as their option. Um, certainly there's been some bumps along the ways. We're re rebuilding stamina and uh, closing some gaps, but all in all that work is, is going very, very well. And then the second informational piece for the board is just to share with you some updates relative to our town partners on Spirit Council, which is the town version um, that addresses issues of equity. So they were uh, recognized before the Board of Selectmen a couple of weeks ago as their own council and entity. And they've also been starting uh, multiple uh, programming options, one of which has been a discussion series called Let's Talk around issues of race, disability awareness, and other social justice topics. So as those opportunities arise, I'll be certain to share those with the board if you'd like to participate. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Curtis, before I come to you, I'm gonna go to our student rep, Catherine. Hello. Um, Catherine. So the elementary schools have had a wonderful return combining cohorts A and B. Uh, more specifically, just to name a few, Latimer just completed its seventh annual fun run um, to school 5K, and they had 250 people running in the race that day, and families shared and posted their times on the PTO Facebook page. Terraphil recently had Bear Week at the school, and the students loved to 
um, watch the live streams they had of the bears in the river within the school's lobby. And as for Henry James and Simsbury High School, they're running pretty smoothly as well. Um, Henry James is continuing to follow the HJ way by being respectful, kind, fair, trustworthy, and responsible as they prepare to fully return to school. And lastly, I can personally speak for Simsbury High School when I say that everyone is following COVID protocols in the hallways and in the classroom. But my one concern is that many teachers have told us students in class that we are around three weeks behind where they were last year. Uh, yet overall, Simsbury has done a fantastic job dealing with problems regarding COVID protocols and safety. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Catherine. That's good to, for us to know. Um, Amy, do you wanna have anything now or you, just later? Nope, just later, thanks. Okay, Mr. Curtis. Yes, thank you. I actually have the data slide that I was gonna share here in communications that we've been um, working through at each of the meetings to kind of kick things off tonight. Okay. All right, perfect. All right, so as we talked about um, last time, this is one week lag data. Um, and as you can see the week uh, ending October 3rd uh, in the Farmington Valley Health District, which is uh, in the top category there, our data stayed uh, on a similar trajectory, improved a little bit. Uh, and what that 2.1 uh, cases per 100,000 uh, represents is actually 16 cases across the 11 towns, um, five cases in school age children. Uh, fortunately, those were not uh, in our community. Our community continues to um, do very well. It was great to hear Catherine talk about the protocols we're following. I know all our students and staff are working real hard uh, to keep each other safe. Uh, and um, we're, on a, we're on a good trend, a positive trend that supports obviously uh, in-person learning. We were excited to welcome back our Henry James uh, community, those students that were in the hybrid model. I went over to the school, visited today, kind of observed lunch and, and talked to the principal and they certainly had a successful day. So while we've seen, as you can see, a, a bit of an uptick in Hartford County uh, that went up uh, from 5.7 to 7.8 uh, and the state went up as well a little bit. Um, in the analysis that we're given um, by the state really due in large part to uh, some small spikes in three communities, Hartford, East Hartford, uh, and New Britain. So we'll certainly keep our eye on that. But locally here, uh, we're, on, we're in the right direction and feeling good about um, what we're doing in the schools and where we're headed. Uh, we have set the target uh, for return next, two weeks out from today at Simsbury High School, and we'll continue to monitor that. Uh, and Mr. Petrina will have a much more detailed communication uh, coming out to uh, the high school community towards the end of the week. But just wanted to continue to put this data up uh, and talk through it in public and um, certainly can respond to any questions that board members have. How did uh, lunch go with the rain today? That Was that a bigger challenge than they hoped for? No, you know, it went pretty well. They have um, a tremendous amount of space over at the middle school. Not only do they have the large cafeteria, uh, but I walked in the gym, which is where Anjanette and Scott were and the kids are spread out really distance well uh, in the gymnasium as well. So they're able to put, you know, one team in the cafeteria, another team um, in the gym, gymnasium. So it looked, it looked pretty good. Great, good to hear. Anybody else have any questions on this? Okay, seeing none, we are on to recommended actions. So I need um, approval of minutes, uh, September 22nd meeting. Can I'll I move to approve those. And a second. I'll second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion carries. Uh, next up is personnel. Yep. Uh, one. Uh, action that requires um, a board vote tonight, and that is the retirement of Wendy Duraz, who is um, a reading intervention teacher at Latimer Lane School, um, but most recently was one of the teachers that we had um, reassigned to be 
in the distance learning classroom to start the year. Um, and that's how Wendy began um, her, uh, her year. And then um, after some uh, personal decisions that she needed to make, decided that it was time that she needed to take her retirement. So she gave us time to find a new teacher that I'll talk about in a moment. And her uh, retirement was effective last Friday on October 9th. Uh, Wendy served 19 years with us, as I said, most recently at Vladimir Lane. Um, and her work is some of the most important work that we have, which is teaching the uh, people, the students who are learning to read and who are struggling with that process um, and really as an interventionist, getting them to where they need to be. So congratulations to Wendy and the motion is there for someone to make. Can I please get a motion on Wendy's retirement, please? Move that the Board of Education accept the retirement of Wendy Duraz effective October 9th, 2020. Well, second. All those in any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much for your right. years of service. Great, greatly appreciated. Yeah. And the other uh, aspects of the personnel report tonight are informational <laughs> as they are new hires, appointments into positions that do not require your vote. I'm going to go a little bit out of order in the way that they are in the exhibit because two of them are filling full-time vacancies. The first is uh, Sarah DeCarolis, who is um, coming to us from the Plymouth School System as a family and consumer science teacher. Uh, and she will actually split her time, two classes at the middle school and three at the high school. Uh, and uh, not an easy position to find these days. And it took us a little while um, until the, the end of September before we were able to fill this one. Um, Plymouth is gonna hold on to her for a few weeks while they now search for a replacement and she'll be with us here in Simsbury probably somewhere around election day. So that is one of our uh, hires. And then um, secondly, you'll remember at the last meeting that um, Jason Stammen, the choir director at Henry James, uh, moved to another part of the state for personal reasons. And I'm happy to announce that Jamie Lapine is our new choir director at Henry James, comes to us with six years of experience um, in uh, some of it in Massachusetts and then um, down here as well. But most recently um, was doing graduate work at the University of Hartford Hart School of Music, and that's how um, we connected with with Jamie. So she uh, started today, I believe, um, might have been last week, uh, but it is uh, our pleasure to welcome Jamie. The other th three positions that are on your exhibit are one-year interim positions, and they're all in our elementary distance learning uh, uh, situation. So I'd like to welcome uh, Jill Duarte, who we hired actually to replace Wendy Duraz. Jill will be uh, in grade two, uh, comes to us most recently from Farmington, but with a number of years of experience at the primary level. And then also Kristen Giliberto, who uh, will be the grade three distance learning teacher. You may recall that uh, Alden Pay, who had been in that position, uh, became an assistant principal in Torrington, and we went in search for another distance learning teacher, and we're pleased to bring in Kristen, again, with six years of experience. And then um, lastly, the new position that we added in distance learning, grade one, once that cohort got very large, would be uh, Agnieszka Petlik, um, who comes to us most recently from New Britain, and uh, just three really great interviews and processes, um, and people who were very much looking for distance learning opportunities. So while these will only be one year positions, we think we found really good matches. So congratulations to all of those five folks, both our um, full-time hires and our interim hires in the distance learning mode. That's great, thank you very much, Neil. And, and I also do want to note that that fills all of our certified positions in the Simsbury Public Schools for this year. So right now, we are 100% staffed on the certified side. Well done. 
Um, all right, moving on to approval of superintendent's contract. Uh, Todd. Thanks, Susan. So uh, annually, the phone rings. So annually, um, as a board, we, we review the uh, superintendent's uh, performance and uh, with the ultimate goal to, uh, to, to extend the contract for, for another year. Um, this is a, it, it's a good process, something that uh, the entire board takes part in. Uh, um, superintendent will do a self-reflection. We'll, uh, we'll go through that self-reflection with, uh, with Matt and uh, have conversations you know, about how the past year has gone, uh, goals for next year, um, always looking to, to uh, make sure that it's, uh, it's a good process, it's an improving process, and, and that, that, that will continue. And um, from, from the board's perspective, uh, even before we started to go into distance learning and hybrid learning mode, uh, there, there, there was a lot of work going on in, in the district. We had some, some leave where, uh, at the same time, we were covering. I say we. Matt uh, was was championing uh, the coverage for for a, a business manager during a construction project. There's a lot of stuff going on, and then, as uh, everybody knows, we went into uh, kind of alternative learning modes and. Um, uh, it, it's been a difficult year, and from the board's perspective, we are very pleased that we have uh, Matt Curtis as a superintendent. He is uh, doing a fantastic job, and especially this year, um, I think going above and beyond um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a leader of, uh, of his team and of the district, uh, very pleased with, with uh, how he's done. And as uh, as somebody who the board can work with, uh, I, I I think I speak for the whole board that um, Matt is always open to to hearing from us and to listening and answering questions and making sure that the communication is going uh, both directions. So um, I don't know if you want me to make the motion, Susan, or somebody else, but uh, I would like to move that the uh, board of education approve the superintendent's contract for. 2020-2021 with a salary increase of 3%. Can I get a second on that, please? Second. Yep. Any discussion? I think, Matt, just all of us uh, would like to reiterate our thanks for your leadership during this incredibly uh, challenging time. And from facilities to COVID, you have really hit all the marks. So uh, we appreciate all your hard work going forward. And Tara, who could not be with us tonight, did want me to let you know she wholeheartedly supports this as well. So with that, uh, can we take a vote, please? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. Thank you very thank much. You very I much. appreciate the support of the board and thank you to my team who worked so hard as well. So I appreciate it. All right. And with that, the Mr. Sullivan, I guess we're back to you with the face mask policy. Sorry, let me unmute myself there. Um, yes, so <laughs> our face mask policy, um, as I said a couple of weeks ago, went through um, uh, largely derived from Shipman and Goodwin's model language um, and went to the policy committee for review and then was presented two weeks ago to the full board with an opportunity for anybody who had concerns or questions to reach out to me in the ensuing two weeks. And I did not receive any communication. So I believe we're on track to approve this tonight. And then we will... Um, from there, uh, far, uh, make sure that it gets communicated out, of course, to um, all of our principals um, and leaders in the school district who are already aware of it, but really need to see the approved policy. Neil, does this, just a question from me, um, the forms at the back and all of the policy, does that then become part of the student handbooks in the schools? I, I don't know that we would um, re 
do all of those forms in the handbook, we would probably okay. operate because uh, we see them as being rarely used, that okay. it would probably be something out of the nurse's office that they would handle um, because they would be the one receiving these requests anyway, so that it would be appropriate for the nurse's office to forward these to parents or um, others who are, who are um, reaching out with a concern about mask wearing. But the policy themselves, will that go in? Probably, probably a truncated version of it. We don't typically print full policies. We, we, right. um, we give summaries of the key paragraphs. Okay, all right. Uh, can I get a motion, please? Move to yeah, adopt move. the Board of Education use of face coverings and school policies effective October 13, 2020. And a second? I'll second. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, so now we're into information reports. October 1 enrollment. This is yes. Sullivan. You want me, Matt, did you want to intro this? Or you want me to jump right in? No, you can go ahead and jump right in. I mean, this is a, I mean, the board's familiar with this report. It's a comprehensive look um, at our 10-1 enrollment with a little bit of a different twist this year, obviously, because we have some important distance learning enrollment information to share. Uh, and Ken and Andrew with us to, to talk through some of the class size information. So go ahead, Neil. Thanks. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite nights of the year, even though uh, others don't always agree, is going over the 10-1 enrollment report. This is work I follow very closely starting um, in the spring and then all the way through summer as we uh, open school and then get uh, final numbers on October 1st for state reporting purposes. Obviously, we're going to look at year-to-year -year, um, numbers, the trends that are there. We will compare it to the projections that we had from um, Malone and McBroom and, and do some explaining of uh, what we think is happening there. And then as Matt previewed, we, we will break this out for distance learning as well. So starting with the first uh, comparison, we just compare last year to this year. Now what I wanna note for all of these numbers in this initial part of the report, this is both in-person learners and distance learners combined. And later in the report, I will separate out the distance learners. So for now, this represents all of our students. And you can see that this year there are, on October 1st, we had exactly 3,960 students, which is 65 less than the 4,025 we had on October 1st last year. Um, we were a little bit surprised by the elementary number being 20 below last year, as uh, in a moment we'll talk about what the projection was, um, and we'll show you where that, that 20 fewer students landed in terms of the schools, um, but not at all a surprise about 45 students fewer at Simsbury High School, um, simply due to the fact that the graduating class that left was much larger than the ninth grade class that was coming in. So um, the high school number very expected, a little bit of surprise on the elementary. And I'm not sure we've ever seen year to year that Henry James didn't move one student, 633 uh, on October 1st of both years. So for a minus 65 overall. To look at those 20 at the elementary level, we can go forward here and um, you can see that um, it, it really, there's no impact that you can point to any one school. All of them are under 10 students less. Uh, Central School, obviously, the exact same number. And then all the others uh, you can see there, very little difference from last year, um, which will be different than um, the projected numbers we'll show on the next slide. So now we're looking at what the actual number is against the projected number. And let me point you to the bottom first and just make an important clarifying point that you're gonna see 4,025, which was last year's October one enrollment number. It's also what was projected by Malone and McBroom for October one of this year. So that is unusual that they were projecting exactly flat enrollment. 
So it's uh, we're still going to be comparing against that 4,025 number, and yet now it's a projection for 2021 that Malone and McBroom did. And you, as you can see, it also is 65 lower than projected, and almost, in fact, more than that total came at the elementary level, where the expectation in terms of projections was that uh, we would have 77 additional students from um, from the year before, and um, or 77 additional students, um, which would have been 57 more from the year before, and that did not come to fruition. And I will show you why in a moment. Where where did the uh, projections come lowest? We're we're probably relieved that they came 26 lower at Latimer Lane, where our biggest crowding problem was projected, and. Um, as in terms of what we saw over the summer and uh, through October 1st, 26 students fewer than Malone and McBroom projected. And then also a uh, squadron line, 19 students fewer than projected. Although that's not as alarming given the size of Latimer Lane. Um, and then I would call the others, um, you know, uh, a little high on the Teuton Hills and Central, you know, usually we're within 10 students on these projections, um, but 65 overall. And I think it'll be more uh, uh, illustrative uh, when I go to the next slide to show you where this came from. So if you want to know why we were 77 below projections, it's because our kindergarten was incredibly small. So you could see that our actual kindergarten size was 252 when Malone and McBroom projected it at 294. So 42 fewer kindergartners than expected. That's a lot uh, in terms of these projections. Certainly we know that many student, many families, given the uh, situation with COVID and anxiety about sending kids to school and the notion of what distance learning looks like for kindergartners simply made the decision that if they had a younger student who was four turning five or maybe even a young five-year-old, they, they clearly made a decision to say, we're going to wait another year um, and not send that student. So um, that's what we think uh, is happening at that a very large number of 42 below projection at kindergarten. But I will say to the board that certainly has implications for next year's kindergarten when we go to look um, at what those projections are going to be for next year is that given that there was likely a holdback of kindergartners in um, 2021 school year, we're likely to see a larger kindergarten class uh, come 20, the 21-22 school year. Um, also, I would point out that the other grades where the projections were low, you can see first and uh, third grade uh, off by 13 and 19 students respectively. Um, and I, I'll point out one other um, kind of pleasant surprise that um, typically from that eighth grade to ninth grade transition, we'll see um, a, a dip in student population as families have the option for more private school options whether that be uh, Westminster or Loomis Chafee or Northwest Catholic or some other um, out of state option. Um, and this year, and, and that's figured into the projections. What we see here though, is that um, maybe a little bit less flight in between that eighth grade and ninth grade transition. Again, as people saw what their options were, maybe not choosing the expense of a private school option Given, given the uncertainties of what we were facing. So overall, once again, it adds up to 65 below projected. We track uh, how the projections run historically. And over the last several years, they've been running a little bit. We've been getting more students than projected by um, a little bit. Uh, board members may recall five years ago or four years ago in 2016-17, um, the projection was uh, very far off. We, we ended up getting 83 more students than at that time NESDEC had projected. Um, and we, kind, we met with uh, NESDEC at that time to 
kind of reconfigure the projections, believing that they were not taking into account the new housing that was going um, on in Simsbury. But the negative 65 that we have this year, we haven't seen in quite some time. You can see that it goes back to the 2012 to 2014 era um, since we've had lower projections by any significant amount. So just, just something to note, although I certainly think it's more explainable um, this year. Hey, Neil, when, when did we switch from, from one from NASDAQ to, to the other? Uh, this is the this is the second year second that we've had Malone and McBroom projections. We switched during the facilities study, and they were okay. they were part of the bid for the long range facilities study. And we, given that the the legwork we did with them during that study as part of that contract, we decided to keep with them, and they're okay. competitively priced with Nasdaq. Yeah, thanks. Hey, hey, Neil, can I just take you back though, for a second? Just, sure. I just want to, I just think it's worth reiterating again in that kindergarten cohort that we saw, I think it was 45, 42, something like that. 42. The drop, I just, again, and I, that, that reasoning sounds is sound to me um, that it's COVID related, but the, um, the outcome of that you're suggesting would be a, a, you know, a larger cohort in kindergarten next year, right? Because th those those kids would be, well, in all likelihood, coming back. Yes, okay. I certainly yeah. I certainly believe that's one of the things I've now sent these um, numbers on to our um, demographer Pat mm -hmm. Gallagher at Malone and McBroom, but I haven't had a discussion yet with Pat about. And what I'm anxious to see is if other communities are experiencing small mm -hmm. kindergartens too. I'm really anxious to see if that's yeah. a trend in the state. And I just, again, just to, just to pick at this a little bit more, again, it's, it's not that those students are not in town right now, right? So at some point they're gonna have to come back. I guess where I'm going with this is I just don't want people to think that there's a flight here that, you know, that, that, that you know, there's, those students are, will not be coming back into Simsbury schools. They, 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 in all likelihood, will, and in all likelihood, will be next year. Yes. Yeah. And uh, to put a finer point on that, we, we track this through our census, and we can track um, people who even um, last February, while we were still in person, came to kindergarten open house to learn about the program and then ultimately decided not to send students. So much of that 42, we can pinpoint to families who came to open house with the intention of enrolling, a, uh, potentially enrolling a kindergartner. There's always some families making that decision, but we, we do believe more made the decision to hold back this year. Great, great, thanks. Hey, Neil, on the kindergarten, um, still on the projections, do you see any kind of uptick for second semester of any of the students, K students returning for January? Uh, I hadn't thought about that, Lydia, but um, I haven't been contacted by any families that, that talked about that. And I'm not, I'm not aware of any principals that have either, but I, I'll, I'll reach out to the principals. I think they would have mentioned something like that to me, but it's I, not really something I had thought about until you, your question came out. Right. I'm just thinking in terms of as we complete one semester um, in December, then if any of the families, um, you know, have any options to come back for January or a different thought of, of mind of returning back to, uh, to Kay and Simsbury. And Neil, I just have one more question about the kindergartners. Could they not attend kindergarten? Could they come into first grade directly? Absolutely. That is... Um, that is an option that families may take and would probably depend on the family's confidence. If, if you have a student who's already reading and you see kindergarten as a year that you did it, you sort of did it at home. We're gonna look at some homeschooling numbers in a, a little later in the report. And it's okay. quite possible that some of these families will homeschool their kindergartner and do exactly what you're saying, which is to put them into first grade. Yeah, so so we could have a large cohort in first grade next year. 
Okay, thank you. Excellent. We'll, we'll keep going through the slides here. A couple of these two are very quick. Uh, we always show you the five-year trend of the Board of Finance likes to see this trend as well. So uh, the five years, uh, 4110, and, uh, when you go five year reports back, and 3960 right now represents a 3.8% decrease, not significant, statistically significant across seven schools. Where it is significant at this point, um, we know that um, our middle school has already now seen its decline um, and it's working its way through the high school now. So it's the, the majority of, of the recent decline has been at the secondary level as supported by this next slide where we look at elementary. And you can see that um, what this is meant to show is after that long period of decline between the mid 2000s and mid 2010s, very significant decline in elementary enrollment. For the past five years, we, that curve has been running flat and then it had started to turn back upwards. We expected it to keep turning upwards. And as you can see, we, we um, experienced this unexpected dip, but I am not reading too much into this one year given um, both those kindergarten numbers and some homeschool numbers you'll see in a second. So, um, to, to look at a summary slide of uh, where we are, the K-12 number that we'll be reporting to the State Department of Education is 3,960, but I will point out that we have 76 um, preschool students. We are capping our preschool classrooms at 13 students right now, um, which is an appropriate number given the inability of preschoolers to really understand social distancing and um, the amount of shared materials and things that go on. Um, so there is a waiting list in preschool and, and um, we, we, we hope to be able to bring that size back up um, next year, obviously. So uh, if you add those 76 preschoolers in, it's still over 4,000 uh, as a system total. The largest cohorts, not surprisingly, are at the high school. Those will be our next two graduating cohorts. And the smallest cohort is, in fact, that kindergarten that we just discussed at just 252 students. Um, the fifth grade, as it's worked its way through, has just um, always been uh, a historically undersized cohort. Um, and we do have to pay attention to that as it works its way into the middle school two years from now. On the bottom line, you'll see that we had 171 open choice students this year, which transitions us into the next slide, which shows you that uh, we're down seven open choice students from the total of uh, our historic high of last year, which was 178. Um, but given uh, where we are with, uh, the overall district total, it is over the 4% threshold that has been a board goal. We've been, over, this is the fourth year, we're over the 4% threshold and we've maintained that. Um, and I'm proud of that work given, it, it was a very difficult year to um, recruit uh, open choice families. And we paid a lot of attention to get a new cohort of preschoolers in. So thank you to Nikki Mahan for, um, really reaching out to those families. And then a lot of our, our other work was with siblings of current students. So while our number is down slightly, um, a lot of districts experienced some um, loss of their open choice enrollments uh, over the course of the spring and summer. Uh, just to take a moment on the magnet schools and out of district programs, uh, magnet schools, both Hartford programs and CREC programs. We are 141 students on October 1st of this year. That's up 16 from 125 last year. I don't see that as a significant number. Um, as usual, most of these are K and pre-K students. Many, many of them in the Wintonberry um, Early Childhood Magnet School in, in Bloomfield. And uh, our experience is that even if they stay through kindergarten at Wintonberry Early Magnet, that they're coming back for first grade in Simsbury, the vast, the vast majority of them. So these 141 students do not get counted in the overall 3,960. 
but we do have four students at part-time magnet schools, which uh, this category counts uh, the Arts Academy, if you choose to do a half day at the Arts Academy, and also students that we have placed at the Farmington Valley Diagnostic Center. So last year on October 1st, we had nine. This year we have only four, but these, these four students are already counted in 3,960. And then hot off the presses is my last slide on the um, enrollment report, which is um, always wanting to report out to the board um, about the new developments that have come up in the last decade, some of them much more recently here in Simsbury. And you can see that we report out um, how, many, how many units um, the developer proposed, how many of those units are already complete and how many are occupied. And then you'll see um, which district the elementary school is assigned to. So um, I don't know this slide, I don't think translated real well. Um, so with Carson Way, it is actually very few students. That number dropped off this slide, but it's only six students um, in Carson Way. In, in Highcroft, we are seeing more students than we had in the past with 21. Uh, the, the other larger players, we're now used to about 20 to 25 students at Dorset Crossing in the north end of Simsbury, sort of um, up uh, uh, past the skating center. And uh, that, that number has really stabilized over recent years. I do want you to pay attention to Cambridge Crossing, which is the single family um, homes that are going in on the land sort of right behind the skating center. Um, and right now, only uh, 24 of the proposed 79 are under contract. 16 of those are built and occupied. And out of those 16 that are occupied, we're showing 15 students at Squadron Line. Or I'm sorry, 15 students in the district, K-12. So that's this is where we're seeing, since they are single family homes, we're definitely seeing more students coming out of Cambridge Crossing, and that's one we're going to have to watch real closely. Um, Aspen Green has now been um, complete for over a year, and I think this is about the number of students that we can expect out of that development. On October 1st of last year, we had 40, and that number shows as 37 this year. That's the one um, on Route 10 on the Avon border, uh, which feeds into Latimer Lane School. And then lastly, of course, the ridge at Talcott Mountain on the Hartford property. The project has actually grown. The original proposal was 280 units. They've now expanded it to 304. It's about half built um, in terms of uh, being able to be occupied out of their units that can be occupied, 110 of 140 are. And we're not seeing as many students out of that. But I will note that given the size of that complex, we made a decision in the last six months that given where we were with Latimer Lane, this property had been zoned for Latimer Lane. And I have been working with the general manager down at the Ridge at Talcott Mountain, and we uh, rezoned it to Central School. And so anybody who um, moves into the properties at the Ridge at Talcott Mountain and is an elementary school family, they will be assigned to Central School, uh, not Latimer Lane at this point. People may think that's uh, far out of Central's zone, but um, Central Zone actually reaches all the way down to Abigail's anyway. So it's actually not that much further to go um, down to the Ridge at Talcott Mountain and, and get those students. So um, that, that's what I have for the enrollment portion of this before we turn our attention so to Neil, size. Neil, I have a question though. So um, go back one on that other slide. So is Dorset Crossing, was that zoned, was Squadron um, zoned for Dorset instead of um, Terrafil? So um, it was a decision made when Dorset was uh, being constructed at the time, the population at Terrafil was larger than it is now. It was much more around 280 students. And there was actually a concern that Dorset Crossing might overwhelm Terrafil School with okay. only its 14 classrooms. So the decision at the time, just like we did with the Ridge at Talcott Mountain, was to send it to Central, to, sorry, Squadron Line. 
Okay. On the map, it is zoned for tariff, though. Okay. That is okay. a discussion we could have going forward. Okay. I was thinking the same thing, Sharon, because if Cambridge Crossing is zoned for squadron um, and it's going to grow that way, we may need to make some adjustments. Yeah. It was already in a normal year through the facilities, we saw squadron was feeling the pressure as well. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. There, there might be part of it too that's, you know, it's it's easier to look at um, properties that are not fully developed too. So that's something you could look at with Cambridge Crossing, because yeah. right now we've established with the general manager at the Ridge at Telcott Mountain, anybody who's coming to rent and they have children, you tell them that it's Central School. <laughs> that they know what they're, what they're choosing when they do it. And um, he, he's been a good partner in that. Okay. All right, we shift gears to the class size report. As usual, I will do the elementary slides and then turn it over to my colleagues, and Jeanette Belmonte and Kem Para. So um, here's the typical slide we look at at the elementary class size report but it's sort of supersized to this year because we have to look at it much more carefully. And so you can see that the first two full text lines across address the in-person learners and the in-person classrooms, I should say, and the bottom two uh, full text lines demonstrate what the distance learning classrooms look like. So I'm gonna take the first two lines uh, for in-person first and you can see that uh, last year at this time, our average primary class size was 19.8, and our average uh, grade three through six was 20.9. Once we made the decision in the summer that we wanted to keep classes more or less at 18 students for social distancing reasons, or be able to move classes larger than 18 to larger spaces such as music rooms or art rooms or libraries, um, that significantly reduced what class sizes would look like. So you can see at the primary, it went from 19.8 average to 14.5 average. And uh, at the upper elementary from 20.9 to 16.3. Um, in, in terms, I'll talk in a moment about what that meant in terms of adding additional teachers. For in-person learners here, you can see um, it, it meant no additional teachers at the primary level for in-person learning, but it did mean um, uh, four more in grades three through six. And then when we look at this for classes that are above the range and classes that are below the range, clearly we have a huge surge of classes below the range, and that's not demographic related, that's COVID related. That's an intentional strategy to make these classes small. Um, so you'll see that many, many of the classes are below the range. Uh, when you look at the, the distance learners, um, you can see that at the, obviously last year we didn't have those classes, so there's nothing to compare to. But at the primary, we have averaged out at 20.7 and at upper elementary at 21.3. In order to accomplish that, we uh, had to devote 19 teachers to distance learning classrooms. Um, I'll also speak about um, there are um, no, no classes in distance learning that are below the range. The chart demonstrates that there are two above the range. Um, those are actually both of our kindergarten, kindergarten cohorts, which were 23 and 23. But I am pleased to report that uh, this is an October 1st report. And October 1st, they were 23 and 23, which is one above the guideline. Since October 1st, three students have moved out of distance learning and our kindergarten classes are now 21 and 22. So if I was doing an October 13th class size report, that number of two would be zero right now. So we're, we're pleased that um, we were patient and, uh, waited for the, the kind of final decisions to be made um, and, and got that into the, into the range. So what this looks like at the bottom in the middle of the chart is that 
it looks like we added 23 teaching positions, 100 classroom teachers last year and 123 this year. And I, I just wanna draw out what those 23 positions are um, for not only our board, but for other boards that may be listening. Um, so uh, uh, seven of those are added positions and I'll, I'll break it down this way. Two of them were budgeted last year. You may recall that we already knew that Squadron Line first grade and Latimer Lane first grade were um, needing an extra section. So two were budgeted and passed in the referendum. Um, in, in terms of uh, the, the other uh, five other positions, came post budget in order for us to accomplish the class size guidelines. Four of them are the new teachers that you see in the chart. And one of them was a late distance learning ad that we talked about earlier in the personnel presentation. So um, two budgeted positions as part of the normal process and then five post budget positions for seven new positions. The other 16 positions to get to 23 classroom teachers were reassigned teachers. These are our people who are our language arts consultants, our math coaches, our reading interventionists. So while it looks like we went from 100 to 123 teachers, um, it's actually only seven uh, added positions to accomplish what I think is a very um, favorable model given the challenges of COVID. So with that said, I'm gonna break down distance learning numbers for you. Um, and what you can see here is that I broke it down two ways in terms of our elementary distance learning program. Um, on October 1st, our number was exactly 399. Uh, and you can see by grade level, um, it was really first, second, third, and fourth grade where we saw the, the larger percentage of families choosing uh, the, the distance learning option and devoted uh, more of our staff to them, a little less in kindergarten, fifth and sixth grade. Um, and then in terms of the schools, uh, 399 students out of the overall elementary total represents 19.8% of the overall population. As you look at those uh, school numbers, they more or less align to um, the overall size of the school, uh, the two schools that are only slightly above 19.8% were um, Squadron Line and Terrafil as a percentage of their populations, slightly above that. And the two that are slightly below 19.8% uh, are Central School and Teuton Hill School. But nothing remarkable there. I think they pretty much, um, uh, you know, just matched the overall population and that those numbers uh, are, are predictable. You know, what was this number at the, at the peak of distance learning? Uh, you know offhand? A, a little bit over 410 when in September. Okay. So by October 1st, it had come down to this 399. All right, thanks. Neil, again, what is the total percentage of distance learning K through six? K through six, it's 19 point, on October 1st, it was 19.8%. Okay, thank you. I will tell you um, that it is uh, lessening. We, we are seeing, uh, again, if this was an October 13th report, um, that number would be below 399. We've had a number of families choose to go back, probably about a dozen families. Um, I can report that out to you at the next meeting about exactly where we stand but that number is lessening um, day by day. Have you had anyone choose to move into distance learning that was in person in the last month? We have um, had a, a less than a handful, but that has happened. Okay. Thank you. Um, on the secondary level, um, uh, you can see 96 students on October 1st, uh, at Henry James, that, that number also has gone down a little bit in the past two weeks. Um, and at Simsbury High School, 192. So you can see just a little bit less than 50 students per grade um, at these grade levels. Um, 
it's a lower percentage because those cohorts are um, a little bigger. And this represents, unlike 19.8% at the elementary level, this overall is about 15% at the secondary level. So um, without breaking it down by every grade level, it's right around 15%. Um, and then I really want to draw your attention to the right hand portion of the slide, which is fully homeschooled students. So these are families that do not enroll their students in the Simsbury Public Schools. They make a cho choice to fully homeschool their students and access their own curriculum. So what you could see for the four years prior to this, we were right around 20 students per year that um, exactly 20 last year. And, you know, if you average that out, it's probably 21 over the course of four years. Um, very consistent homeschool numbers. This year on October 1st, 46 students in homeschooling. Um, you'll see my note there that there are 28 new homeschooled families. Um, what that means is that of the 20 from last year, two of those students moved out of district and we were informed by those families that they had moved. So 18 returning homeschool students, and then you add in 28 new homeschool students. Um, and of those 28, three quarters of them, 21 of the 28 were in the primary grades, K through three. So for me, when I take the kindergarten number being way below projection, and this homeschool number K through three being way above historical averages, there's your explanation of why the projection was off. So, I mean, it, it's, it's like a fully explainable um, reason why the Malone and McGroom projection was 65 low. But Neil, so, so we have an idea of, you know, like we have the distance and we have homeschool, but what we don't know is, and it may just be mixed in there with homeschool, those who have just decided to unenroll and just move the kids into um, Ethel Walker and whatever, we, we don't know those numbers, right? Well, they, th those, if they had been students with us last year, yeah. yes. they would have withdrawn their students. Right. So, so we, I, I certainly don't have um, a big trend on that, okay. but I can look at our summer withdrawals and see if there's any pattern. Okay. Yeah, because there, there is, that's a good question, Sharon. There's some comparative data. We've done that before in the district. We could go back and, and look at, I can't remember what the percentage of that overall is, but that would be an interesting look. Yeah. Um, Neil, actually, I was looking in Exhibit 5 on page 3, I think it is. You do have a table of summer withdrawals. Yes. Um, and there are numbers for Henry James in the high school. Henry James was 34 and the high school is 29. Right. So I can I can look, certainly, I'd, I'd probably take the hardest look at the high school numbers and see um, because those are where our private school options usually are. That, that, that That's always a funny number for me um, in that what it represents is only movement. It doesn't represent any kindergartners, um, and it represents movement from the day of graduation till the day school opens. Like we, it's literally like what happens during the summer. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting piece on that, Neil, is the bump up in the freshman number that we normally see when there's attrition right. to private schools. Um, yeah, there's some different things going on for sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. And we end uh, our data report by focusing on class sizes at Henry James and Simsbury High School. So I am gonna kick it to Anjanette Belmonte, who is our master scheduler at Henry James to talk about uh, class size at the middle school. Great, thanks Neil. Hi everybody. 
Um, so really important to share that um, Mr. Baker and I spent the entire summer really trying to put together a schedule that was conducive to the COVID reopening requirements, as well as maintaining the true concept of our teaming philosophy at Henry James. So what we did was really focus our efforts on not only balancing the cohort size, but balancing the class sizes, balancing the distance learners per team, and all the while trying to maintain the social distancing that was required. And in order to do that and achieve those goals, we really had to focus on a true teaming model in which each grade level was attending their core classes at the same time. And that regardless of what class a student went to, they were always with their teammates, thus keeping the cohort intact. So um, as you can see, the number of classes that were needed to achieve this model needed to increase in order to make that happen. So we went from 267 sections up to 283, so a difference of 15 classes overall. Some of the things that we had to look at when we were building the schedule and help us maintain this new concept and model was, um, you know, what things did we have to basically sacrifice in order to achieve this change? And we did have to um, reduce this year the year-long unified arts electives. Those were no longer offered in grade eight. We also were not able to achieve pullout lessons for our music students this year. And we also had to remove connections from the schedule. But knowing all the while what we were able to maintain or gain was that our students were able to still get their first choice in world language and music for our current students. And that wellness with the increase in staffing there, we were able to offer wellness on a daily basis to our kids. And that's such a great piece of what we wanted to do to the schedule. And there is so much support and focus on social emotional learning taking place in wellness class that what we feel we lost in connections, we're certainly making sure that we are putting an emphasis on in our wellness classes. So when we put all of the schedule pieces together, we were able to see that the classes that exceeded the Board of Ed guidelines was only two. So that was a 50% reduction for us, which was great to see. And we found um, that that was just the case in one science class and one social studies class. And then there was a slight increase in the total number of the under-enrolled classes from last year. So again, just one from 13 to 14. Um, and that basically was in the core subject area. So we were able to really make some true teaming concepts happen. Um, the cohorting is working very well. I know Mr. Curtis said he was in today and he was able to observe lunch. We are thrilled to have our kids back full time at Henry James. We had a great first day and this teaming model just has so many positives that we're hearing from the students that we're hearing from the staff and wanting to take some of those ideas from this year and certainly embed them in next year's build um, to keep that teaming alive. Any questions for questions? That's great work. I know that's not easy, Anjanette. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. All right, Mr. Para, why don't you take us through the high school piece? Okay, great. Um, as I was preparing for this, uh, it dawned on me that we start build. Well, we start building the schedule in the spring, and about. A week before I think spring break, that's when we finally made the decision last year that we were going to go out of school. And at the time it was two weeks because I remember I had to run around and, and get all the department chairs information from them because I couldn't wait the two weeks. I had to start building the schedule. So we actually built the schedule. And if you recall, we were going to the eight drop two. So we built the entire schedule around an eight drop two schedule. And then um, probably in July or so, we made that decision where we had to go to the block schedule. So we had to go through and make a lot of adjustments um, to make sure that it fit into a block schedule. And then um, I can't remember when it was the hybrid was decided on, but it was pretty late in the summer. And so we really had to look through at that point. Uh, normally, I'd be looking at balancing classes and, and looking at uh, class numbers. 
I had to do the same thing this year, but it was very different because once we went to the hybrid, I had to look at the classes for the number of students whose last names began A through LEN and then the opposite of that. And we couldn't go over 14 in those. So the balance wasn't really around if there's 23 in one class and 15 in another, it was more around how the breakdown uh, occurred alphabetically. So in doing all of that um, and kind of constantly wrestling with that because we, we, at that time, we didn't know who the hybrid learners were going to be or excuse me, distance learners were going to be. So we just kind of moved forward with what the class sizes were. Um, and then it, it, Neil had come up and said, we have the October class report. Basically, that seems almost the next step to me uh, in doing all this. And um, it wasn't something we really thought about. So when we put this together, I was very happy uh, to see that we're actually, for the most part, trending in the right direction here, that we still had nine fewer classes that exceed. We do have uh, an, a slight uptick uh, in the number of classes that are below, um, but that's actually kind of where we want to be as much as we can be. Uh, regarding class size. So it was a lot of effort from a lot of people um, to get to where we're at, but we're we're pretty happy with where the numbers are. And, it, and it's still something that we're looking at, obviously, as we're going to, to full time um, in two weeks is the announcement. We're trying to figure out how we can um, create the safest classroom environments through class size. And that's something that we're constantly looking at right now as well. So that's the uh, history of this particular um, set of numbers. I really thought I was gonna present uh, an eight drop two schedule to you this year, but uh, obviously that didn't happen. So we'll have to wait a year on that one, I guess. Yeah, and I, I just wanna point out if the board wants to jot it down, uh, I don't know why the number, the total number dropped out on number of classes, which was 526 last year. And in the yellow, the total should be 529 for this year. So I'm not sure why it dropped off the slide. Anyone have questions for Mr. Para? I, I was just going to say to, to both Ken and Jeanette, uh, putting this stuff is, is nothing short of miraculous. So I just uh, appreciate all the, uh, the work. And I know, um, you know, maybe one of my sons caused a little bit of a headache in that last week before school. <laughs> and, uh, I apologize for that contribution, um, but uh, it, it is it is it is an incredible puzzle that you guys put together that just amazes me every year. Thank you, and I think um, Ken, right? We should give um, a huge shout out to Cindy Heffernan, um, who really helps guide us with all of the scheduling decisions and the puzzle pieces, and then to our own. Um, scheduling secretary. So Donna Stumper and um, Kathy McElveen at the high school, just without them, the team really doesn't get much done. So thank you for that. Everyone. 100% agree, Anjanette. Thank you. And Ken, now you've had practice doing the drop two schedule. So you'll be all good next year. Yeah, it'll be like old hat. <laughs> I didn't, I still have it. I have it uh, saved on a, on a Google document. I don't want to give it up. It was so much work, but uh, it is what it is. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, Ken, just for the um, for the benefit for the listening audience or, or parents or community, maybe just you can just quickly concise what the drop two schedule was before you move to a block schedule. Yeah, it was uh, eight periods again, like we currently have eight periods, but essentially only six periods would meet a day. So you drop two, so we call it a drop two schedule. It was a four day rotating basis. Um, and the classes would also alternate. Um, so you, your period one wouldn't always be the first period of the day. The first four classes, one, two, three, and four periods would rotate, and then the second would rotate. And that would allow us to still share staff with Henry James. Um, so it's actually an exciting, I like the schedule, I like working with it, but um, um, it, 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 it didn't work. And, it, and the, the block helps us have fewer transitions. And a quick question. Yep. Um, I have two questions actually. On the at the high school, um, one of the the feedback or something that I heard that I thought was curious is as as awesome as the eight day drop to rotate four thing is, <laughs> has the has any consideration, 
you know, I heard one of the positives, if there is anything on the COVID, is this half the schedule for, you know, those, those block days doing it two and two, that that has allowed kids a little less stress. Not only does it work for there, but it's less stressful on students, I've heard. Is that something you're getting feedback on? Is that something you would ever consider? Are our kids getting a lot less hours of instruction doing it that way? Or is it the same? Um, the hours, I'm not 100% certain, but it's certainly not a lot <laughs> less, but the number of meetings is are fewer. And, and that has an impact. We've been, um, I agree with you. And I think even last year when we had the, the other schedule, the kids would tell you the block days were a lot less stressful because you only had to worry about four classes. And usually it's three. And if, if, your, if your cards fell right, um, the scheduler did his job for you that year, I like to say. Um, you, you had uh, maybe a, a one day that was kind of lighter than the other days. Um, but I, And I think that's part of it. Another major factor, though, um, in regard to the less stress right now this year is we have really our teachers have really embraced and we've really enforced a lot about the homework policy, about when you can collect work and when you can't collect work about in classes. And that, that has reduced the stress as well. Um, but, um, you know, we heard earlier in the meeting that we're not quite where we want to be in terms of curriculum right now. And, and that's uh, part of the equation as well. Yeah. It's just been interesting that, that the feedback I was from the kids was that it was like, like less stress when, Thank God, at least something is less stressful. <laughs> um, you you then, take one, not, not to take Monday off, but you have that day, which is less stressful. And, and quite honestly, I, I think our arrival has impacted the amount of stress when you can kind of take your time to walk into the building with the, the staggered arrivals as well. Um, there are definitely some things that we're going to be able to take out of this and say, hey, this was a positive out of all of this. Yeah. Right. Okay. And I hope that at both at Ed Henry James too, that's something we can do. That's amazing. And then the um, the other thing I was going to ask you is just about the um, the lunches. Has the schedule impacted lunches at all? Um, it's actually been a, a very good thing right now in that we only have two lunch waves. So for the first time since I've been uh, in Simsbury, your class isn't split up by a lunch because you're either going from you know, you're the period before to lunch, or are you going from the period four to your full class to lunch, the way that we have the lunch waves. Um, it will be impacted when we transition to full time because um, right now we have the two lunch waves. I just held up two fingers, but they were very low. So I held them up high. We went for the two lunch waves um, and they're working pretty well. Numbers wise, they work pretty well. And so if you bring everyone back in, if you want to keep those numbers the same, you have to, since you're doubling your population, you have to double the number of lunch waves. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably, we're going to go to probably four lunch waves um, to keep the numbers low. And that's going to impact the classes. Now on the, on the same uh, token, when you go to four lunch waves, the period becomes longer that lunch is in because you have, uh, it just has to be longer. So um, while there will be a breakup, for the most part, kids will have a pretty good chunk of time, even if they have second or third lunch. It's great. Kudos to you. No, thank a you. lot of juggling. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of students. Yeah. Catherine, can you attest to us a little bit? Are you feeling less stress? Is it working? How is it working for you? Um, yeah. Just to echo what Mr. Paris said, I find that like arriving to school later is a lot less stressful. I really enjoy that. Just to get like those extra minutes to sleep in is nice. And also I find that block days are a lot less stressful as well because we don't have as much homework. So I don't know, that's my opinion, but I know Great. it differs between students, so. It's good to hear from a student directly though, thank you. All right, anybody else? All right, then it looks like we're on to COVID expenditures. I'm not sure who's who we're going to. Yeah. <laughs> so some good news to report this evening. Um, if you take a look at where we are for our total expenditures for fiscal year 21, um, you'll have noticed a decrease from the last time I reported out. So the last report showed um, total expen expenditures of about $920,000. And here you'll see that um, currently we're at about $800,000. 
So there was a slight increase in some expenditures on the technology side of things. Um, the previous technology issues that were discussed at the prior meetings, we had some of that equipment come in and those items were expensed. So that was about $30,000. But then if you take a look at the personnel line, um, the previous report, we had anticipated about um, a loss of about $275,000 um, because we did have to add those five um, teachers that Neil had mentioned earlier. Um, however, Neil's office did a great job. Um, a lot of the outgoing retirements that were at higher pay rates, he was able to hire um, talented people at lower pay rates. Um, and therefore reducing our overall expense to the budget. So all in all, we are going to be over budget in salaries about $120,000, um, which is lower than the $275,000 that we had previously um, thought that we were going to be. So some good news there. So um, with the money that we had from the non-lapsing account and our year-end savings from fiscal year 20 that the Board of Finance allowed us to retain, um, and then the CARES money that received, that's um, it was a little bit over a million dollars in available funding. So that, and then we take out the, um, the care, the, um, I'm sorry, the COVID money, the COVID expenditures that were being paid for via the general fund. And this leaves us a balance of about $280,000 in our non-lapsing as of right. Any questions? Questions for Amy. I just want to say that's really good news. <laughs> really good. <laughs> we could be in a very different situation. So we well could. done on the hiring and mm -hmm. well done all around. When you tie it to the, the conversation Neil gave before about when you look at the 23 additional sections and how we got there to create the model, um, the fact that we can say that and right now, not that things could change because there, this is a, certainly a fluid situation, um, that with that non those non lapsing dollars, we're in a a, a pretty good sit, a pretty good position right now is encouraging. I think I'm flabbergasted. So I'm I'm very happy to hear that we're in a we have positive in the non lapsing. That's great. And I feel like my New York just came out in a really big way. So there's that. Um, so is there any other questions for Amy? Not hearing any, we would be back to public audience in a normal meeting, um, but we do not have any of that. So we have our next board meeting on Tuesday, October 27th, 2020. Uh, we're working on an in-person location that might work for that. So we will keep you all posted. And I would take a motion to adjourn. Y'all want to stay and hang out with me? Motion, our uh, motion to adjourn. A second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you all very much. Have, have a good evening. Good night, everybody. And everybody have a good night.